Just, uh... Let's pop this guy. Ah. Uh. <laughs> hey! Oh, why does that smell like ass? Welcome all to a new series on my channel called Beer in a Movie, where I watch a beer while I drink a movie. It's beer in a movie, yeah! Oh, I should have refrigerated this. That's warm. 2005, Twilight sets the world on fire with its popularity. Publishers think that they've cracked a code in our brains. We got the code now, guys. We know exactly what they want. Which then sends unpublished writers, in hopes of securing their first book deal, to basically just copy and paste Twilight into a new series, but changing one or two key details. So it's basically the same, but it's also not technically copying. Let's take Fallen, for example, and you tell me if this sounds familiar. It's the story of an awkward, pale brunette whose blandness is so intense that it attracts mythological creatures from the neighborhood in the shape of hot men to approach her. Blandy is unable to get hot boy number one out of her head despite repeated attempts to get his attention, and he does nothing but blow her off and be a complete douchebag towards her. Just the elements of a classic love story. <laughs> when Juliet told Romeo, like, bro, you're a fuckboy, I ain't into that. Ah, oh, that's such a good first chapter. Gotta love Hamlet. Oh god, this is so bad. Oh, did I forget the cloudy, dreary setting? I, how could I forget? Compile those elements, and what do you have? Well, you have yourself a bestseller. Twilight basically secured the werewolves and vampires in the teen romance department. You can't take those same elements. So writers had to choose a new mythological creature for 14-year-old girls to fantasize over. And the options were plentiful. I'm talking fairies, elves, Mermaid men. I almost said mermen, but that word is gross, and I don't want to say it. Writers instead settled on a different mythological creature. Angels. <laughs> and let me tell you, the number of angel books that came out in this time period... Welcome to the story of Fallen. We're gonna get into it deep. This is a story that I did not know existed, despite being immensely popular. The book has 474,000 ratings on Goodreads. For reference, Fallen has more reviews than Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and Fifty Shades of Grey, both of those combined. Now, while what I just said is not true in the slightest, I feel it accurately represents my surprise at seeing such a great number of ratings. And since we're talking about ratings, Fifty Shades of Grey got a 3.63 on Goodreads. It is very, very difficult to get a 3.5 or lower. It's hard to tank a rating. It really is. Fallen got a... <clears throat> Damn it. Fallen got a 3.73, which is a difference of... 7... Uh, thousands, seven ten, seven ten thousands. That much. It has that much difference. However, not only was the first book popular enough to make a movie off of, it was popular enough to spawn three full sequels. Of course, we have the amazing book two, Torments. We have the uh, incredible book three, Rapture. Or was it the fourth one? Damn it, that was the last one. That's the fourth one. Passion is the third one and Rapture is the series finale. I'd just like to add here that I read a summary for all the books, and book one, boring. Book two, way more boring. Book three, it starts to pick up, and book four has some of the craziest shit that I've ever heard, but also I'm not surprised that a YA author put that into their book. We're gonna talk about it. Needless to say then, talking about the summaries, I have not read any of these four books. Nobody has. Despite having a crazy number of ratings, I could not find a single reader who has actually read these books. And I talked to a number of readers. Nobody had even heard of it. So, let's move on to this gem of a movie trailer. The trailer was posted to Hot Movie Trailers, where only the hottest of movie trailers are posted. 4.7 million views though, that seems pretty hot. And I'd really like to talk more about the trailer because... It, it's, it was interesting enough to maybe watch the movie. However, the last half of the trailer spoils the end of the movie. And when I say spoils, I mean that the second half of the trailer is the last 10 minutes of the film. It's every it's everything. So I think we just make the leap and jump into the actual film. Cheers, cheers to that. Oh God. 
The movie begins with exposition, which is just solid directing choice. <laughs> About angels. So God and the devil were up there duking it out. Angels were choosing sides, left and right. And then this guy, he was like, Nah, bro. I'm in love. I don't want to choose a side. So God said, Okay. Then you can get the fuck out. And then he banished that angel to Earth. And all the other angels who hadn't yet made a decision between God and the devil, he banished them all to Earth as well. And he said, You cannot come back to my kingdom unless this guy forsakes his love and chooses me over her. So their freedom is contingent upon this man choosing God over love. And when I tell you this movie tries to like pin everything on the devil, but then glosses over the fact that God's just like, you can't stay here, bro. You gotta get the fuck out. Choose me or choose nobody. And then the entire movie's like, ah, oh, the devil, erg. <laughs> We're introduced to this girl who is the ordinary everyday girl named Luce. That's right, Luce is her name. Hey Dylan, is that a nickname for Lucy? It is not. It is short for Lucinda. Lucinda. You didn't see that one coming, did ya? Me neither. You see, Luce was on medication because she kept having these visions. And sometimes when she had visions, it got very dangerous. One time she had a vision and a house set on fire, and a boy died. Yet she does not want to take these pills that stop the visions. Why? Even if it means being locked up, I'd rather be me than pretend to be something I'm not just to fit in. Well, if that isn't the most baity teen relatable bullshit I have ever heard, and let me reiterate, she is responsible for a kid's death. And not only that, but if she takes these pills, she can just go home. And for reference, this is where she's gonna be staying if she doesn't take the pills. She gets this one small room with a little window. She's not allowed to have any metal or her cell phone. And she gets one phone call every week for 10 minutes. You know, like, like a, a prison. prison. But no guys, she's gotta be her. Some spilled on the edge. I hate when it spills on the edge and it makes it sticky. Edward is just napping in the library. Oh shit, did I call him Edward? Oh, hmm, I wonder where that name came from. <laughs> and then this girl just creeps up in on him, right? And then he wakes up and he sees her staring at him and then she just continues to stare. And it's like, I finally realize why you were institutionalized. This is some creepy behavior. If you are caught staring at somebody, we all instinctually know the protocol. You look away and pretend like you don't know, you never looked in that direction your entire life. And in fact, my boy runs away because he understands how creepy it was, but he has his turn to be creepy because he's about to save Luce's life from this falling angel statue. Oh, how much have I drank? Drunk? Oh, Jesus. Dog, I'm such a lightweight. I've had a, a tenth of a beer. <sighs> Anyways, I was saying, he has, he f saves her life from a falling statue, and then he's weird, because he rolls over, but then he just stays on top of her, face to face, so close that they could smell what each other had for breakfast. She tries to thank him for, you know, saving her life or whatever. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to say thanks yesterday. And he completely blows her off. He wants none of the credit. He wants to be left alone because she knows a little bit too much. Does that sound familiar to you? Sounds familiar to me. Meanwhile, mythological hot boy number two comes in steaming. <laughs> he comes in hot. Thinking that he has any sort of chance when we all know that he's gonna be relegated to the friend zone after maybe a kiss or two. But it's okay, because I'm sure he'll find love. There's a fifth book in the Fallen series that is, I think it's from his perspective, and I think it's him falling in love with uh, Luce and Edward's baby. Like it's a day old and he just claims it right there. That's my baby. Now this guy is my favorite. They try to pit him as the stereotype super hard. I mean, look at him, he comes in full leather, Sultry stares, 
He owns a motorcycle, and watch the way he eats this sucker. You know that this is gonna turn on 12-year-old girls. Do you guys remember how I talked about how the movie opened with exposition? It's a very quick and dirty way to just shovel information into a viewer. It's also known as info dumping. That's another term for it. For some reason, the director decided not only to start the movie with some exposition, but 20 minutes into the film, they decide to have a classroom scene where she learns about the angels, which is the same exact information that we as a viewer got at the very, very beginning exposition. And I mean, it is the same exact information. Neither scene is good. It is quintessential showing instead of telling. The fact that he kept both is the boldest of choices. And when I say bold, I mean dumb. Uh, for the record, I would love to say that I've watched this movie one time the full way through paying attention, and then I've like kind of fast forward through certain scenes in writing the script. So I've watched this movie like two or three times. And if you put a gun to my head, and made me guess any character names besides the girl, I would die. Well, that's not true. If there was a gun to my head, I would pivot my body and then twist the gun in the opposite direction of the wrist, securing the weapon for myself. Then I would shoot the firearm into the thigh of the perpetrator, thereby rendering him incapacitated while I contact the proper authorities. It's beside the point, but I also want the record to show that if I were in such a situation, I would be able to manage my way out of that. And any contradiction to that is heresy. And I beseech you to shut your fucking mouth. Gun. Boom. Let's fast forward a little bit. Luce goes to a party in the woods with a bunch of psychopaths and criminals. You know, students that this school she goes to now exclusively takes. Then she decides to leave on her own. Just a skinny, beautiful, pretty girl out into the middle of a woods, not too far from a bunch of criminals, by herself, without a cell phone or a weapon. What happens, Dylan? She's attacked. To no one's surprise, well, a little bit to your surprise, because she's not attacked by a person. She's attacked by a cloud. Which is, uh, very scary. It's, it literally tastes like someone peed. Oh, we can't forget the pool scene. That's like a new addition to the code that the publisher has cracked. Pool scenes, obviously, why wouldn't you have them? Because all the hot people get naked and wet. Victory for all young teenage horny horns. And he has to give her the old speech. You know the one, I'm no good for you. You should stay away from me. And then, <laughs> my man has the best exit to a scene I've ever seen. He turns and he broad strokes his way away from her. Hey, don't go. Listen, we can't be together. My life is just not conducive to having you in it. I'm sorry. Whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> We're on to the bar scene, and our girl Luce is about to get some lip action. Guess who from? It's from Cam, Mr. Leather, hey. Trading in the lollipop for some lip, lip pop, lip pop bomb, lip. I don't know, I didn't work out a joke. And uh, I'm a little too drunk to create something at this point. I am shocked that this movie didn't have a seizure warning in the beginning because it's just flashing lights everywhere. I paused. Here's the moment I paused the movie actually, and I got up and walked away because my eyes were legitimately fucked. It's time for Edward to reveal the story to us. So he he's still playing it cool. He's like, there's no way she knows. So he's like, I'm a normal guy. You're a normal girl. We don't know each other from our past lives or whatever. But I just so happened to be writing a comic book about angels. And, oh, this drawing of you? Yeah, I kind of used you as inspiration for the female lead in the comic book. But it's a totally fictional story, and it's not you or me as the angel, even though the angel also looks like me. Anyway, she's cursed to die at age 17 as soon as she kisses me. I mean, the guy. And that's the story. And it's like, she knows. She's been having visions of her past lives with this guy. So she's he's not fooling anybody. It boils down to this. She is born... And roughly around age 17, 
she meets this angel again, they kiss, she dies, and then she's reborn, and 17 years later, they kiss, she dies, she's reborn. It's that cycle since the beginning of time. And my man just does not learn his lesson. He just keeps kissing her. Man, rub your noses together. Eskimo kiss, do something. <laughs> Fucking great. This time, it's a little bit different because she was not baptized for the first time in like forever. You were never baptized. Um, no. Meaning that if she dies, she dies for a goodsies. There's no reincarnation this time. Now, this man forsook God in order to be with this girl that he loves. So you think that maybe he would hold off on kissing her just until they run to the church and get her baptized real quick. Just a quick dirty baptism. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Is that how pastors baptize? It's like they're turning a page of a book, like, uh, baptize, uh, baptize, uh, baptize. But no, my man accosts this girl and he's like, we have to kiss now. Now. Please. And to me, it's like, how horny do you have to be to sacrifice the love of your life, the lo your eternal love for a person? For one quick snog, for all my British viewers. Anyways, the movie ends with uh, the teacher being the bad person. She slashes the girl's friend's throat and then she disappears into a black cloud, which leaves us with a movie that is finished without a villain being defeated and no plot progress being made other than this girl found out that there are angels among us, which everybody who went to go see the movie well, they didn't go to see it. I'll talk about that in a second. It's information that everybody knows as a viewer. So the only thing that happened is that this girl caught up to the viewer what we know. <laughs> that is like if Twilight... <clears throat> if Twilight ended with the baseball scene. So she finds out that Edward's a vampire and then new vampires come to town and then Edward's like, oh, we gotta keep you safe. And then the movie's over. That would be so bad, right? And perhaps the worst part is the climactic battle. It is between the two love interests, the love triangle, right? The problem is this guy has shown that he has genuine feelings for Luz. What I feel for Luz is for real. She's different this time. So we know that he's not the person that's trying to kill her, but this guy doesn't know. Yeah. So it's just a misunderstanding. So they're fighting, even though we know that they shouldn't really have conflicts, because he's not the bad guy. On top of that, the fight scene is shot in a really poor way. I'm gonna give a counter scene as an example. Zack Snyder's Superman, uh, Man of Steel. That ending fight sequence between Zod and Superman, that had real impacts. It had consequence on their surroundings. It had like a brutality. It had like a physical toll. Because it felt like two superpower beings fighting each other. You could feel the punches. And I love how the camera moves. I have never seen a fight sequence with this shot in it. It was absolutely new to me. I loved it. Now compare that to these two fighting. They're just in the clouds, lost. It feels like the camera gets lost, honestly. There's no sense of consequence because they're just in amongst the clouds. There's no interaction with their environment. And honestly, I don't even know who's who and where they are. Now here's where things get interesting. The film lost money. It got a 7% on Rotten Tomatoes. However, it was produced with the budget of a summer tentpole. It looked like a summer blockbuster attempt by a movie studio. And yet it only has 14 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Now Wikipedia says that it made $40 million and that is just incorrect. There's no way this made money because it wasn't released to theaters. It was released direct to DVD. And I think that the executives knew that this would flop so hard that they just decided to pull the plug before even trying. Now I tried to look up why and I couldn't find any articles about it. Whether there was like some sort of controversy, they had to pull it from theaters or something. I couldn't find anything. It all just feels like a dream. It's this super popular book that is hated by all the top reviewers. Nobody that I talked to has ever even heard of this and it came out after Twilight, so it's still somewhat relatively new. It gets made into a movie with a tentpole budget, 
and yet it gets released straight to VOD. With any failed TV show or movie, there is, of course, going to be a Twitter hashtag campaign to save it. <laughs> Despite the fact that most people who have read it hate it, and the people that have seen the movie also hate it, they're trying to get it revived, man. And there's one particular account that is kind of like the central hub of the fallen renaissance. Uh, the Risen. So they have a tweet that it, it's pinned, so you know it's important. They said that they DM'd the author, and the author told them exclusively that there is a TV talk in the works, a TV revival. And then someone asked for proof. Can I see the DMs? And the, uh, the person who's running the Twitter account said, It's through DMs, and I guess you need to take our word for it. If it wasn't true, Lauren would have tweeted us something, now wouldn't she? Guys, I just DM'd Julie Andrews, and she said that she was super into me. <laughs> you don't believe me? Um, I think that she would have come out and said something if she wasn't into me. But she didn't do that, did she? Hmm? Obviously because it's true. Okay, I know you're all waiting for this. I read the summary for the first book again, just to see if there's any differences in uh, the, the book to the movie. Couple differences, doesn't really matter. Book two sounds like this most boring second book I could have imagined. I was bored reading like a four paragraph summary. Book three starts picking up. Book three, there's some stuff that happens in it. It's a little bit interesting. Book four is wild, okay? So from my understanding, the story goes as follows. Satan rebelled against God because he wanted to reset time to a time before Luce fell in love with uh, Edward. Because Luce dated Satan at one point in time. When I tell you I thought the love triangle was gonna be these three, but instead it ends up being these three? Oh, what? She is literally responsible for splitting heaven in two. She is responsible for hell itself. The whole plotline borders on fanfic, which this book series pretty much is. It's a fanfic of Twilight meets Mortal Instruments. And that, my friends, is the story of Fallen. The popular book that nobody has read that was adapted to a movie with a huge budget that nobody saw and went straight to DVD. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have four and a half... I f oh, wow. Wow! I finished this much? I thought I was, like, up here. <laughs> wow. I'm a weird drunk. I... Did I just say I'm a weird drunk after drinking three quarters of a beer? <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I have five of the Coronas to pound. And hopefully, by the time I wake up from my blackout, I'll have forgotten all about this Fallen Saga. Wish me luck.